Daniel LaRusso. Our favorite car waxing, fence painting, and floor sanding teenage underdog that inspired a generation of 80s kids to practice their crane kicks in the backyard and take karate lessons at their local strip mall dojo. And it's no surprise that our friends at LJN decided to capitalize on this martial arts mania by releasing the Karate Kid on the NES. Now I know this is an LJN title and we are all aware of their reputation with licensed games, but I'm asking you to watch this video with an open mind to see if we can breathe new life into this misunderstood title by sharing all the secrets and history you need to become a Karate Kid NES master. Let's get started. If this is your first time here at the channel, my name is Tyler, and if you love gaming from all generations like we do here at G3, then consider hitting that subscribe button and hit that bell for notifications so you don't miss anything. In 1987, few pop culture phenomenons rivaled the success of the Karate Kid franchise, with their first two films grossing over $200 million at the box office, and the toy company Remco releasing a popular action figure line in 1986. So when another toy company named LJN decided to begin publishing NES games, the license for the Karate Kid was one of the initial three they acquired, with the other two movie-based licenses being Gotcha and Jaws, with all three of these NES games releasing in North America in November 1987. LJN subcontracted development for these titles to a budding software company named Atlas. The lead programmer for the Karate Kid was simply referred to as Hitomushi. An additional programmer named Keuru Ogura was responsible for at least one and according to a few sources possibly all of the bonus stages. The music was composed by Hirohiko Takayama and was a major contributor to many Atlas developed NES titles like Friday the 13th, NFL Football, and Gotcha the Sport. I considered it a win finding this much information about a young Japanese development team in the early NES era but there is infamously documented evidence that there was plenty of behind-the-scenes drama with the team at Atlas, and this wouldn't be the only game they developed together. The following year, in 1988, Namco released a Famicom game translated as Erika and Satoru's Dream Adventure. This game was developed by Atlas with Hitomushi, Agura, and Takayama all participating. Hitomushi programmed a brutal hidden message in this Famicom Adventure title bashing his co-workers which actually plays the remix version of the Stage 1 theme song from the Karate Kid during one of his rants. He named names and held nothing back, especially when speaking of Agura. I honestly can't even share what he said here on the channel because I try to keep this a family show. But if you're dying to find out, there are plenty of websites that will give you the exact complex timing and button combinations you need to execute to reveal the hidden message. Now don't say I didn't warn you because these messages are quite graphic. Let's leave the drama behind and examine the box art and manual for the Karate Kid. Say what you want about LJN, but they sure knew how to present compelling game boxes to catch your eye while browsing the store shelves. And it's no coincidence that LJN used the same artwork from the Remco toy campaign for the front cover of the NES game to appeal to the younger demographic. The Karate Kid on the NES lets you take control of Daniel-san, and you get the chance to fight your way through select plot elements from both the first and second Karate Kid movies, although it's more heavily influenced by the events in the Karate Kid Part 2. Daniel's controls are a huge downfall for this game, as it is definitely not an intuitive setup. For starters, Daniel can move in eight directions, which is difficult to perform reliably on an NES D-pad. And to make matters worse, jumping is not executed by pressing the A or B buttons. You must tap up on the D-pad. This can make for some deceivingly difficult jumps over the pits and platforms in the later stages. There are your standard kicks and punches, but you can also accumulate special powered crane kicks and drum punches by collecting C and D symbols left behind by enemies and by successfully completing bonus stages. These special techniques are executed by just tapping the B or A button without pushing the control pad in any direction. If you don't want to waste your special moves, you must hold the D-pad in some direction while hitting A or B to execute a simple punch or kick and that just seems completely backwards to me. There are one or two player modes along with a one-on-one -on -one feature where you can play against a friend, with player one being Danielson and the other being his nemesis from the sequel named Chosen. The Karate Kid only has four stages that you must complete to beat the game, but the developers made up for this shortcoming by making each level significantly more punishing and difficult than the last. Stage 1 takes place at the All Valley Karate Tournament and is the only level paying tribute to the first film. 
The remaining stages are set in Okinawa and include Karate Kid Part 2 movie elements such as the typhoon sweeping through the village and the ceremonial summer festival at the castle by the sea. Three bonus stages are hidden throughout these levels in dark doorways and crevices and provide a nice break from the action. These bonus challenges include catching flies with chopsticks, breaking ice blocks, and dodging the swinging hammer which always gave me fits as a kid. And I'm not ashamed to admit I didn't fully master this technique until I was prepping for this video. The manual showcases the different enemies you will encounter including Chosen, and the cleverly named Follower of Chosen, and Enemy with a Spear. Strong work on those character names, guys. And I'm 99% sure this dude was on 90210. In reality, every enemy you come across in the Karate Kid is the same, with only subtle clothing, hairstyle, or skin tone changes. I mean, the guy that's supposed to be Johnny in the All Valley Tournament doesn't even have blonde hair. Mr. Miyagi, Kumiko, and Miyagi's best frenemy, Sato, appear for a life meter boost at various points throughout the game. I may be thinking too deeply on this, but perhaps the developers have Sato appear while he is being crushed under the village rubble, so you can make the choice to save him just as Miyagi did in the movie by collecting his game sprite, which brings you new life by being compassionate and forgiving to your enemies. Sounds good in theory, but as always, I'm probably dwelling and need to move on to our pro tip section. Even though LJN's Karate Kid does have legitimate technical flaws we discussed earlier, I still feel it has enough charm and tie-ins to the film to warrant you to play through it at least once. Before we cover the first stage, if you happen to have an NES Advantage joystick, you might find it easier to control Daniel-san, especially when trying to execute a diagonal jump across platforms. Again, the first stage is the All Valley Tournament and you must defeat four opponents to advance. This is by far the easiest section of the game, and you can win by simply spamming kicks until you reach the final round where you have to be a little more strategic and time your crane kicks to win. Stage 2 shifts the gameplay from a traditional one-on-one -on -one fighting style to that of an action platformer. You must advance through Miyagi's old village in Okinawa to face off with Chosen at the end of the level. I recommend hoarding up as many crane kicks as possible during this stage. I like to stand at the bottom of these two staircases near the beginning of the level and take down the continuously spawning enemies to collect around 15 to 20 crane kicks before advancing. An added bonus is that you can gain a few health bars each time you collect one of those special attacks. And there is no time limit so you can farm crane kicks until your heart's content. And don't forget you can also get a new life after you rack up 20,000 points. Make sure to jump around in doorways and dark spaces to find hidden areas containing one of the three randomly generated bonus stages that will award you extra drum punches and crane kicks. Let's cover the best strategies for each of those sequences. The chopsticks fly catching stage is the easiest one to master in my opinion. Six flies will be scattered throughout the room and they each fly in a circular motion. I recommend keeping your chopsticks stuck at one level here at the top of the screen and only focus on one fly at a time. This makes it much easier to snatch that fly with the A or B button when they come near the chopsticks. But you only have 15 seconds to catch all six. The ice block breaking stage is the most unpredictable. There are six blocks of ice for Daniel to break while trying to stop the quickly changing power meter at the highest level. The manual hints that the power meter is linked with Daniel-san's breathing. But I even slowed down my game capture footage to investigate this further and I still don't see a definitive correlation. I just try to tap the A button as early as possible in the level and for the most part I seem to get it near the top of the power meter. I've discussed this game with a few friends over the years and we all agree that the swinging hammer stage blew our minds. None of us could time this right and would immediately get knocked in the water. You must dodge the hammer swinging from left to right six times to complete the stage. You can dodge by tapping the A or B button while facing the direction where the hammer will be approaching you. Press the button just a moment before the hammer hits you to use the drum punch technique to send it flying past you. Now immediately turn Daniel in the opposite direction and repeat this sequence another five times. After exiting a bonus stage, just continue advancing while attacking the ever coming horde of enemies. This level is pretty straightforward and will introduce you to the maddening kickback effect Danielson experiences after taking a hit. Make sure you don't get caught between two enemies because if one hits you they will start tossing you back and forth like a ragdoll and it can be hard to escape this barrage. Due to a limitation in the game's programming, only two enemies can appear on the screen at one time. So if two are behind you, you can cruise your way through the rest of the level without fear of any additional attacks. 
When you do finally face Chosen at the end of the stage, you can defeat him with a few crane kicks in seconds. The Typhoon strikes the village in stage 3, and it's the level that gives me the most trouble. You must dodge the flying sticks, rocks, and birds and fight harsh winds pushing Daniel backwards. Even though it seems like the flying projectiles deal as much damage to you as the enemies, that's not entirely true. These objects do produce the knockback effect, but they never take health away from Daniel. So if you're having trouble timing the kicking or punching of these items, it's not that big of a deal. Try to take the high ground as much as possible during this level to stay away from enemies and ridiculously difficult pit jumps, due to having to take the wind and enemy kickback effect into account. Just like the typhoon scene in the movie, Daniel must save a little girl waiting out the storm at the top of a bell tower. Chosen does show up at the end to battle you, but you can skip this fight and quickly climb the bell tower to save the girl and advance to the final stage. Stage 4 brings daniel on a wardrobe change and takes you through the rocks and ruins of the castle by the sea during the summer festival. The enemies are stronger in this level and you will finally see those Luke Perry spear enemies for the first time. You can try to avoid the spear by retreating to higher ground and they will simply walk by you. You could also try to jump on their head to make them drop the spear. You can take advantage of beginning the level on the high ground by allowing the first few enemies to pass under Daniel. Shortly after, an enemy will appear behind you, but make sure you don't attack him. Just let him trail behind you. You will soon come across a small cave that an enemy will fall down into. Immediately jump over this cave and you should now have two enemies behind you to make traversing the rest of this level a breeze. Just make sure you only fall and don't jump down into this cave because if you jump you will activate a bonus stage and lose your two trailing enemies. These enemies will follow you to just before the final showdown with Chosen, who is holding Kamiko hostage in the castle. Although I was disappointed that Chosen didn't zipline into the fight like he did in the movie. Make sure you stay as far to the left of the platform as possible during this battle, because for whatever reason, Kamiko will fall off of the platform and kill both of you if you stand more in the middle of the screen. Again, Chosen is an embarrassingly easy final boss, who crumbles after only a few crane kicks. And I guess you can try to defeat him with drum punches as well if you want to be a stickler and stay true to the movie. Mr. Miyagi will now congratulate you for defeating the Karate Kid on the NES. The Karate Kid is by no means a perfect game, and I can see where many people consider it frustrating at times. I also have spoken with many gamers who enjoy the game as much as I do, and were pleased with how well it made an effort to stay true to the iconic scenes from the movies. These same people may also be hesitant to admit they enjoy this game with the mob mentality that faces any LJN game. And that's not just my opinion, because the Karate Kid is listed as number 135 on Ranker.com's best NES games of all time list. I would note that this list may be a little wonky because it's ranked higher than other well-respected titles such as Kung Fu and Gremlins 2, but no list is perfect. I believe Mr. Lawrence summed up the NES game best at the end of the first movie. I agree, Johnny. LJN and Atlas did alright on this one, and I'm cool with that. Special shoutouts to William Pugh and Skylar Ishmael for finding Mullet Boy first in our last video. Till next time, guys. G3 out.